down women with diluted dreams of hope for joy has been washed down the stream. I'm Robin Hawkins, and you're listening to Watered Down Women. Hoping to be free, found a new home in the cemetery. In today's world, it seems that there is no topic that isn't fair game for disputing and debating. The rise of cancel culture, or erasing or rejecting, a person or idea that seems offensive or objectionable by others has now crossed over into books, cartoons, and even fairy tales. This modern form of ostracism has called for the end of careers for some individuals and for online book burning of the works of particular authors. In regards to fairy tales, the debate continues as to whether or not some stories actually help or harm children. The University of Honolulu argues that fairy tales have a positive impact on children by helping them make sense of what it means to be human and how to better understand the world around them. It uses Carl Jung's Jungian talk-based psychoanalytic theory to explore the effects of these whimsical adventures on its reader, and actually found that they provide a positive aid in child development, and discovered that children as young as three to four can differentiate between make-believe and reality. However, British newspaper The Guardian argues that fairy tales are dangerous for imagination-lacking and imagination-deprived children who might interpret the falsehoods as truths. So, the debate continues on the world stage. But for the purpose of this podcast, suffice it to say that a fairy tale life was coming to fruition for young Betty Edmiston when she was reunited with the object of her primary school crush. In last week's episode, we met Betty, whom I incorrectly refer to as Betty Jo Edmiston, but I have since come to learn from a very reliable source that Betty's middle name was Jane, and that she was named in honor of her grandmother, Cynthia Jane Nip. And as we learned... Betty's family had left their home in Olive Hill, Kentucky, and migrated north to Richland County, Ohio, as her dad sought employment in the booming industrial economy. After spending time in Ontario, the Edmistons moved to Mansfield's North End community to Harmon Avenue, which ran off of Bowman Street. A short while later, a now-grown Harrison Bond headed north in search of employment for himself, and he ended up moving in with his sister, who, ironically, lived down the street from Betty's family. For Betty, this was a dream come true. She and Harrison, affectionately known as Junior, began dating, and before long, the now 18-year-olds married and began life together in hopes of finding their happily ever after. Soon after exchanging wedding vows, Junior received a job offer from the Chrysler Company. So he and his new bride moved to Indiana. At this point in her life, Betty was quite innocent and very idealistic. She was deeply in love with her husband and desired nothing more than to be mother to his children and to grow old with this man of her dreams. Within weeks of the marriage, Betty became pregnant, and one month before their first anniversary, she gave birth to their first child, a daughter whom they named Sheila. Betty loved being a mom 
and proudly doted over her daughter and found true satisfaction in her role as housewife and mother. Soon, she discovered that she was pregnant again, and shortly after her first birthday, Sheila became older sister to Betty and Junior's second child, daughter Lisa. And one year later, these two little girls welcomed baby sister Pamela. Life was peaceful and pleasant for this family as they enjoyed their quaint and tidy home located in America's heartland. Junior enjoyed a secure and well-paying job during the day and spent his evenings and weekends spoiling his happy wife and adoring daughters. When we think about 1950s Americana, when conformity and uniformity was commonplace, the bonds could have easily been pictured on marketing material as an example of living the American dream. During this time in our nation's history, men were decidedly the head of the household and served as the family's sole income earner. And women were expected to be hardworking homemakers, caring mothers, and above all, obedient wives. According to her younger sister, Mary, Betty had no objections to her housewife role, and as a matter of fact, she took great pride in caring for her family. By the time Mr. and Mrs. Harrison Bond celebrated their fourth wedding anniversary, they were parents to three beautiful daughters, enjoying life in a comfortable home and looking forward to a bright and happy future. As that year was winding down, the family eagerly anticipated ringing in a new year and enjoying all that their serene and delightful life had to offer. Perhaps on the evening of Wednesday, December 31st, 1952, Junior, Betty, and their three daughters, Sheila, Lisa, and Pamela, gathered together to celebrate. Maybe Betty had decided to keep the Christmas tree up until after the new year. So they sat together in the living room, admiring the twinkling lights, sipping hot chocolate, and singing Auld Lang Syne. But instead of times long past, their focus was on their future. We'll never know how they spent that holiday evening together, but we can hope for their sakes that it was time well spent. As Indiana residents rolled the calendar ahead to 1953, they endured a typical cold and snowy start to the new year. A popular song that year was performed by a crooner named Frank Sinatra, whose soft, low voice promised that fairy tales can come true. It could happen to you if you're young at heart. Not only was Betty feeling young at heart during this point in her life, at 23 years old, she was also very young to withstand what lay ahead. That January day started out as typical as all the rest. Junior headed to work and Betty kept the home fires burning as she prepared breakfast for her daughters, tended to the laundry, and completed household chores. During that week, her husband had been troubled by a toothache that was causing him much pain and discomfort. He scheduled an appointment with the local dentist and left work early to go have the tooth removed. Upon leaving the dentist's office, Junior felt that something just didn't seem right as he began to feel nauseous and weak. Instead of returning to work, he stopped at an aunt's house to call his employer and say that he wouldn't be coming back that day. And then he drove on to his own home. 
Betty was surprised to see her husband come home before his shift ended and was very concerned for his well-being. He told her that he'd be fine, but just needed to rest for a while. As Junior settled himself on the couch, Betty continued about her work of preparing the evening's meal. When she went back to check on her husband, she quickly noticed that he was pale and barely responsive. Panicked, she drug him to the car, gathered her daughters, and then Betty, who was not a licensed driver and barely knew how to operate a car, drove her very ill husband to the local hospital. Harrison Jr. Bond had slipped into a diabetic coma, and five days later, the 23-year-old husband and father of three died without ever regaining consciousness. Unlike the next verse to Sinatra's promising song that declared, you can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams, Betty was no longer feeling young at heart. And not long after laying to rest the man of her dreams, this very young mother of three discovered that she was pregnant with her fourth child. Imagine what it must have felt like to be in her situation. 1953 was a significant year for female milestones as Margaret Fay Adams became the first female to become commissioned as a doctor in the United States Army and Ovida Culp Hobby became the first woman to serve as Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. In today's world, most 23-year-olds are fresh out of college, and their biggest worry is deciding which job offer to accept and which student loan to start paying off first. But in 1953, a newly widowed 23-year-old mother, all alone, with three little girls and a fourth child on the way, Betty Jane Bond was now facing a world of uncertainties, fears, and countless unknowns. Not only was she unemployed, without a driver's license, and living hundreds of miles away from her family, Betty was forced to forge ahead to find a home and a way of life for her and her children. Thankfully, she could rely on help from her family and siblings. So early that same year, they helped her pack up her daughters and their belongings and move them back to Mansfield, Ohio, back to the family home, which was located just down the street from Harrison's sister's house, the very same house where an 18-year-old Betty was reunited with the man of her dreams. Just imagine how she must have felt each day as she passed the place where she and her beloved dreamed of their future, prepared each detail for their wedding ceremony and planned out their long and happy life together. And just imagine how Betty felt on the morning of August 13th, 1953, as she was driven past that very house. Glance at the place where Junior had lived his last days as a bachelor. And now she was headed to the hospital to give birth to his last child the one they conceived just weeks before his death. Later that day, Betty gave birth to Junior's fourth and final child, another daughter whom she named Robin, a daughter whom her loving husband would neither hold in his arms nor give rights to on his back, a daughter just like the other three whom Betty would now have to raise on her own and without the greatest love of her life. Water down women with 
Diluted dreams are home for joy has been washed down the stream. Grab a shovel and join me each Monday as we dig a little deeper and uncover the tragedies of watered down women.